What's up and welcome to Idol Insights, a show where each week I, Trevor Bettis, talk to interesting people about Idol champions and Dungeons and Dragons. With me this week is the amazing Mr. Mark Mir. Hello, Trevor. Hello, Mark Mir. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We're, we're, we're very excited because we're talking about your character today, and I am so mm. excited to dive into uh, that conversation. But first, if uh, well, actually, you know, I'll say this one first. Uh, we're live right now. Uh, this is not a pre-recorded show, so if you have any questions uh, for Mark throughout the show, you can put them in the chat with question colon, and then your question, and our awesome mod Sean will grab them, put a little text doc. Uh, but Mark, if people don't know who you are somehow, who are mm -hmm. you for those fine folks who may not know? My name is Mark Mir. I do voices in video games, and I also play the RPGs. And over the last few years, I played a lot of RPGs online, on streams. And here I am. And one, one of those streams uh, was actually an official Dungeons & Dragons stream uh, called the Black Dice Society, which was a Ravenloft stream. Yeah. Oh, okay, you're back. Sorry, it glitched out for one second. I was like, oh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> how, much, how much valuable information did the people not get? Anyway, <laughs> I did a I did a Ravenloft stream on the the D and D channel called uh, the Black Dice Society, DM'd by Mister B. Dave Walters, and, and occasionally uh, yourself. I'm on a, on rare occasion myself, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I I played Brother Uriah Macabre, uh, so he was my character in that campaign. One of my favorite campaigns of all time i've been playing dungeons and dragons since the early 1980s and, and uh that is certainly one of my favorite campaigns of all time not least of which because i got to be a pc but b dave also in addition to letting me dm on occasion uh let me play one of my all-time favorite dungeons and dragons villains azalin rex yeah. the king of darko and again, if you don't if you don't know Mark, Mark uh, Mark understands the assignment on things. He didn't mess around when it came to Aslan. <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna get into that. Uh, sure. So so what? Let, let's start off with with Black Dice Society. You know, you you said it was a Ravenloft game run by B Dave and whatnot. Mm -hmm. What what was different about it from like what you might consider like the standard uh, uh, streaming show and whatnot? It was Ravenloft, so it's darker, right? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, Ravenloft, of course, is the horror setting for Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, especially in the most recent version that they put out, uh, they sort of point to the fact that Ravenloft can be a vehicle for all sorts of horror, not just the traditional gothic horror, which mm -hmm. most associated with, but also cosmic horror, things more in the vein, uh, things, uh, body horror, all sorts, yeah. sorts of sorts of horror uh can be found <laughs> within ravenloft and its many domains of course the one that people are most familiar with is barovia which did of course feature prominently in our campaign because there were ties to the vampire strad von zarovich mm. uh, and my character was of course uh linked to one of the other domains uh darkon which yeah. is uh which uh in previous editions had been ruled by the lich king Azalin Rex. Now, in the current setting, in the Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft uh, that we're presented with, uh, Azalin is a wild card. Azalin can be, is sort of like, well, no one's quite sure what's going on. <laughs> the dungeon master of whatever campaign that you're running uh, is sort of free to make Azalin what they need Aslan to be. Uh, so in the current continuity, Aslan may well have been destroyed. Aslan mm -hmm. uh, may be scheming in the background. And he was certainly doing that in our campaign. I know because I was the one doing the scheming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, B -Day, it was it was an interesting uh, way to tackle it because I had to really compartmentalize. Uh, yeah. I knew I Aslan knew things that U Uriah didn't. And I I, you know, when you're a, you're a long time dungeon master, you are good at compartmentalizing yeah. of like, okay, this character knows this, they, you know, this character knows this, they don't know, they don't share a pool of information. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we, we did, as you mentioned, go all out. So when, whenever Aslan showed up, I was doing it in a full silicone so prosthetic good. mask and, uh, uh, a, a crown that was uh, created for me by, uh, Dustin Fletcher and Devin Henderson of D4, uh, which is, I oh, I didn't know that. Yes. I, I believe they've recently rebranded as Elder Eye Entertainment. And, mm -hmm. uh, so they made fantastic Iron Crown of Dark on for me. Uh, mm -hmm. and I believe, uh, Mr. Eric Jarman. Uh, another fine prop maker from Atlanta also had a hand in that. So I had the full Aslan costume. I had a silicone uh, lich mask and uh, it was in contacts and the whole bit. So yeah, we went all out. And if you've seen the Black Dice Society, you know that I'm not the only person who brought some, some cosplay to the table. Uh, 
I actually think I uh, talked with Nora about that on the yes. episode we had her on. <laughs> yeah, Nora Nora was probably uh, the most uh, dedicated cosplayer among us because <laughs> I, I think I had a pretty good costume, but it didn't take me that long to put on. And That's I know fair. For, I know for a fact that at like at one point, Nora spent like three, four hours in makeup for just a little one shot that we just did for the Patreon. Oh yeah. yeah. And she did it with all just like normal makeup, not even like special like body paint makeup. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That no, she told me that during okay. the episode that blew my uh, mind. <laughs> <laughs> even more impressive. Uh, so yeah, there was, and of course we know that uh, Becca was mm. always blue. She did yep. that with a film. She did. <laughs> look but, great let me tell you that oh yeah and, I, I i loved her i loved how many times in the episode it'd be like okay did she actually paint herself blue <laughs> and uh you know sage of course had uh, valentine's tentacles and the whole mm -hmm. bit so yeah we we like to uh bring things up uh you know every everybody had a little bit like uh um uh, I know that DJ, like he had fangs for mm -hmm. Desmond and uh, didn't always wear the contact, but you know what? He's not always in wolf form. So that makes True. sense. And, you know, Tanya had the ears. So we, we always tried to, you know, have little elements of our characters at the very least. And, you know, Uriah, of course, is most famous. The hat is the, the tricorn hat is probably his signature piece of apparel. I love uh, that hat. But yes, when, when I, when it was as, when I was playing as when it was, it was up a whole new level. So I, I, I'm going to get give a chat a heads up. We're probably going to get a little spoilery when it comes to Black Dice because there's some there's some stuff that's in the game that happened later on into the series. Yes. Um, so, Spoilers you know, for the Black Dice Society. We'll say that right now. And I, so, you know, maybe if you want to be surprised by things that happen in the course of your rise adventuring career, then watch this video later after after you watch those i will say though even if you know a lot of the things the journey there is incredible <laughs> oh, thank you um so i i want to start off with just kind of the the at the ground level how did you come up with brother uriah well uh it's interesting uh the uh thinking back again to my early 80s dungeons and dragons experiences the thing that you most often heard was we need somebody to play the cleric and uh, because the cleric was often, you know, the, the least regarded of the, the initial mm -hmm. character classes. Like, oh, I got to be the healer. I got to. But uh, that is kind of what happened. Initially, when B. Dave contacted me, he uh, he he'd approach me and and talked about Aslan Rex. And I misunderstood. I thought I was only going to be playing Aslan Rex. Oh. Uh, and I was thrilled at that. It was just like, ooh, I get to be one of my favorite D&D villains and show up occasionally and, you know, uh, uh, menace and befuddle the players. But <laughs> I didn't realize I was actually one of those players. So as we were going through the process, you know, everyone's creating their characters. And uh, B. Dave sort of dropped me a line and says, yeah, yeah, I haven't seen your character in D&D Beyond yet. Are you going... I was like, well, aren't we just going to, like, do I need to roll a character for Aslan? He's like, yeah, but you're in the party, too. I was like, oh, oh, geez. <laughs> Great. I didn't know that. I'm thrilled by that. That'll be, that's fantastic. Uh, but, of course, by this point, everyone had already made all their character choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, so everyone, you know, they had picked their classes. And the glaring omission was a cleric and mm. you probably you know you're playing a ravenloft game yeah. a cleric or a paladin is a really good idea so uh, so yeah that was that was sort of decided and i was like yeah, okay yeah i can play the cleric i'd, I'd recently you know i hadn't played clerics that much i tended to mm. be more ar arcane i do like spellcasters but i tend yeah. to go more arcane spellcasters uh so when b dave said we need a cleric it's like okay well i played a cleric in d4 so it's like yeah, okay, I'll try I'll try a cleric again. And uh then it was like, okay, now let's see what will this cleric be. Again, everyone else had sort of made all of their choices. So yeah. uh uh no fault to them, but they they'd taken all the cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the things that were in the Van Richten's. Yeah, band. yeah. And essentially our show was was created around that time to you know to coincide with the launch and yeah. show off all the stuff in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. So we already had uh Tanya had decided Fenn was going to be a Dampier and uh, DJ had picked uh, a lycanthropic player for Desmond and we had uh, uh, reborns we had like uh, um, uh, both Valentine and Nahara were mm -hmm. reborn so you know there there were some things there was there were there were some things that I could have you know still like uh you know hexblood or or things like that but it occurred to me that 
what if I'm just like a Freddy cat human in essentially a party full of monsters? Yeah. And when you think Freddy cat and scary stuff and Halloweeny things, Ichabod Crane, of course, immediately springs to mind. So my real North star during this character creation process was like the Disney cartoon version oh, yeah. of Ichabod Crane, like from the old Legend of Sleepy Hollow, that or what? It, what do they actually release it as? Like Ichabod and Mister Toad's Adventures. Yeah, some some, like some weird title because <laughs> it was it was bundled with like there was a Mister Toad story, mm-hmm. and then the second half was the Legend of Sleepy Hollow with Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman. Uh, so that was that was definitely my inspiration was the cartoon Ichabod Crane, and. He ended up being one of my favorite characters ever <laughs> because he was constantly terrified. And I it, it didn't occur to me immediately in the character creation, but like as we were playing, it's like, yeah, you, it's kind of really valuable to have a character like that in a Ravenloft campaign because Ravenloft is a scary place. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense that one of the characters at least would be terrified out of their minds the entire time as they're encountering all these domains and dark lords and things that go bump in the night. Uh, the, the the first moment you did that voice too, just the 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 little like hiccup in the voice and everything. Like it was it was absolutely perfect. I remember editing that episode just going, Chef's kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, your Uriah was a lot of fun. And mm-hmm. And uh, stuff just came up organically, like Uriah and Hara's romance. That that all blossomed very organically and slowly. I've got questions about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we had fans like they were going, "Like, I love a slow burn, but come on, guys, pick it up, pick it up," <laughs> because it was weeks and weeks before. But I know, love they... the I love the will they won't they though. But like, I, I mean, like, mm-hmm. I oh, I was happy with it. <laughs> but I again, it took like so many sessions before they even like I think you know, held hands or something. Yeah. Like that for the first time. You so guys were... bought a ticket together at the Witchlight Carnival. <laughs> that, was their, that was their first date. That was yeah, their, it was and, so you know, cute. They'd been working together for some time, but that was their first official date. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Nora always refers to them as uh, sweet shy babies, and they both were. <laughs> that is accurate. And Although well, I, I think... I think okay. Nahara, that was the only aspect. Like, you know, Uriah is just like a blanket sweet shy baby across all interactions with everyone. Uh, but uh, it was it was really fun to seeing a character like Nahara also have that sort of you yeah. know shyness to you know, considering that she's, you know, throwing spells around and has wings and yep. you know, is an undead reborn and all this. Uh but uh, their relationship was was really fun to play. Well, that, so I want to ask you about that. Like, w- was that something you said it came up naturally? Was that a conversation though that happened like in between episodes? Like, okay, is this something that we that we want the characters to pursue, or is that just something uh, that kind of just happened through the episodes? Not not until like very far on. Like it was just you know the fans they love to ship yeah. characters. Oh and, yeah, and so like that that started coming up and like i think uh what was Naharaya? i think was there you know, <laughs> i didn't names? heard that oh my god <laughs> i can't remember i'm i can't remember which fan came up with that first but yes that was that was floating around there were some alternate versions of it as well but clearly yeah the fan sort of decided Ooh, that's you know that this might be nice to see and so we were aware of that certainly mm-hmm. so we we kind of guided it uh well the the, the thing is it was already happening like yeah. just in the character interactions and i, I as I recall, I think it worked out so perfectly because like in our Zero episode, the one that we did at GaryCon, uh, the online version of GaryCon, mm-hmm. I I believe that Nahara was the very first other member of the Black Day Society that Uriah encountered. And yeah. They, like, yeah, they're they, on the road, yeah. They met at the crossroads. Yeah. And, uh, and again, like I, I, looking back at it, I don't, I never had any plans for this and none of us did have any plans for that, but looking back at you know the dialogue that i improvised going back at the, to the vod it's like oh yeah it seems like this was laid in because i think i said something like you know well i certainly would have remembered meeting someone like you and that's it just seems, right and it just seems like he's smitten with her right from the get-go which is not necessarily what i was playing but it's like yeah that actually it makes perfect sense so that's so fantastic it all, it all worked out yeah so so what what was uh again we're gonna get into spoilers here chat uh what what was uriah's arc like like obviously you, you started off with this uh you know ichabod crane like character but what mm-hmm. what was what was his progression over the course of the show 
Well, uh, first of all, he's uh, so he's a cleric of Ezra from Ravenloft, uh, and certainly he was terrified of all things supernatural and, you know, as you might be if you lived in Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was immediately thrown into a group with uh, with undead and a dampir and a lycanthrope, uh, that immediately just threw, <laughs> threw his yeah. entire worldview into disarray. Uh, these were his friends, uh, but he had been taught that, you know, uh, you know, lycanthropes, they can't control themselves there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then he encounters Desmond, who's completely in control of his lycanthropic abilities. He also had a past relationship with Finn as well, because she had saved his life at the carnival when That's he right. was a child. Uh, so he was inclined to trust her because... She had saved him from a truly horrific fate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then realizing, oh, no, this person who saved me is a dampir and doesn't have, like, ulterior motives to, behind saving me. And, uh, again, he's a cleric, so he's, uh, and a grave cleric specifically, so he's, like, he's almost trained to hunt and destroy undead, and yet mm -hmm. these are his friends. And eventually this is the person he loves. So that was that was his initial arc of growing and yeah. and learning to accept everybody uh and of course he's a very kind-hearted soul so he he wasn't say prejudiced per se but mm -hmm. he was certainly he was ignorant uh yeah. and uh and some of his fear is justified because he's in ravenloft so a lot of a <laughs> everything's lot of this, trying to kill you <laughs> a lot of the things that you encounter will try to kill you yeah so that was his initial uh his initial introduction uh and then of course now we're getting heavily into spoiler mm -hmm. yeah here it is yep. uh he finds out that he is not just a typical human either uh he finds that there is this connection that he has to aslan rex the former uh now the dark you know, dark lord of darkon the king of darkon who has essentially abdicated his throne but is still pulling strings in the background and one of those strings that he can pull is Uriah. And we introduced this sort of slowly that on occasion, Aslan was literally able to take over Uriah and speak mm -hmm. through him. And I, uh, I got I to jump in real quick and, and give you massive applause for the switching between those. The episodes where you had Aslan talking through brother Uriah <laughs> are just incredible. Like one of them, I, like, I was editing an, a show at one point and I literally had to go to the video just to see you do it. Because I heard you just quickly switch between the voices. I'm like, no, I need to see Mark do this. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really fun aspect. And, you know... It uh initially it may have come out of practical things like just oh we want aslan to appear but we don't want to like wait five minutes for me to like throw yeah. on all the costume in the main uh having uriah possessed by aslan gave us mm -hmm. a way for aslan to like be in the game and in game play and not just in pre-recorded segments and things like that uh so but it worked out perfectly and gradually we found out uh, the deeper connection uh, between Aslan and Uriah. And this was me bringing back bits of lore from previous editions uh, where clones of Aslan played very heavily mm -hmm. because Aslan is, of course, constantly trying... His his whole thing is that, you know, uh, much like Strahd is constantly trying to get Ta Tatiana, his Tatiana, back, mm -hmm. uh, his lost love, or, well, love, the, the woman that he was obsessed with. Let's yeah, yeah there, I like that he one. did not like her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we call her a lost love. It's like ah, his lost obsession. Like he's yeah. a stopper, Strahd is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Aslan's obsession is just escape. Like he just wants to get back to Greyhawk, which is where he's from, the initial, the original D and D world. Yeah, and he's he just really strains against the chain. He's he ironically he has the the size of a continent. It's like huge, yeah. vast, vast kingdom that almost anyone would be satisfied with, but not him. Because number one, he knows it's not real. And number two, he comes from Greyhawk. So he's like, I'm not going to live in this fish bubble when my real aspirations are to be like Vecna or Sererac. You know, this is, I'm not going to be the, the lich exhibit in the Dark Powers Zoo. I'm, I'm getting out of here. So one of his schemes involved creating clones of himself. And mm -hmm. they, uh, again, through previous editions, they came in uh, Llewellyn Desheen, which was something I always just tried to like seed in the old lore uh Llewellyn Desheen who became death in, in the old continuity the lord of necropolis and then there was also S another clone of him a female clone of Aslan who oh. was actually the author 
of uh, do you, if you remember the old Doomsday Gazetteers, like yeah. the old Ravenloft Gazetteers. That, uh, they she was the author. She was the one who was going around and writing oh. all this on a mission from Aslan. And again, it was never explicitly spelled out, but you could read between the lines and That's there were fan lore. theories. And one of the one of the prevailing ones was that S is actually a female clone of Aslan uh, that was raised human and sort of sent and. Mm. Uh, so this this idea of Aslan creating and seeding these clones and maybe placing them with human families to be raised so they have essentially a normal life yeah uh, and and an actual past so they they don't have false memories they're actually they did grow up in whatever village and they you know they had relationships and they remember but he they're linked to him because they are his clones mm -hmm. and his initial idea was. Uh, overcoming his curse one not only was he trapped in Darkon, but he had a curse that was particularly odious to him which was he could not learn any new magic and one no. of the primary reasons for for becoming a lich yeah. was so that you have, have all of eternity to study yeah. magic it's like well you have all of eternity but you literally cannot learn any new magic the, the twilight moment you zone it, it with the, the broken glasses <laughs> yeah yeah very much so uh so that was one of his his schemes was that he was going to have his clones uh, essentially study new magic and then he'd be able to pull the knowledge from their mind because they were essentially oh. parts of him. And there were also schemes involving like, well, if I can get one of my clones outside of Ravenloft, <laughs> then maybe I can use them as an anchor to get out and, you know, lots of things. He had lots yeah. of irons in the fire. He's asking. <laughs> uh, so the idea that I had uh, initially, and I spoke with B-Dave, is that, yeah, Uriah is a clone of Aslan. Doesn't when know did it, that come about? It. Was that before the show started or was that later on? This was, yeah, no, this was very early on in character oh, discussion wow. ideas. Because of course, you know, I'm having not only my PC discussions with uh with B Dave player yeah. character stuff, but also like, okay, so what's Aslan actually up to? What's Aslan doing? And and this was one where it's, uh, again, one of those things compartmentalizing where it's like, Aslan knows that Uriah is one of his clones and has been using him all this time. Uriah yeah. has no idea. Uh, and it it, it kind of went into the background enough that, like, when it started coming to the fore, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I am a clone of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, and that, yeah. It, it was yeah, a bit that's... into the show that that was revealed. And, and so that I had always wondered when when that had come about. Uh, yeah, it's like the, the seed initially, like we weren't talking about it constantly or like, it was like, I think this might be, you know, Uriah, Uriah's actual origin story, the, his secret origin that even he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And then of course, later, uh, especially when I DM'd, uh, especially we brought in another character who is mentioned in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, Firan Zalhonen, who is, spoilers, uh, he is the form of as. That's who Aslan was before he became a lich. He was mm -hmm. uh, a mage named, an archmage named Firan Zalhonen from Greyhawk, became a lich. And then after he became a lich, he he came into Ravenloft. Uh, so in the current, again, the current continuity, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, Firan Zalhonen is sort of presented as, well, oh, this is a character you can do something with. And you can decide what he is as mm -hmm. Dungeon Master. He can be something different in every campaign. In ours, we specifically decided that we went back and forth on it a little bit. We were like, is, is he just a front for Aslan? And then we were like, oh, maybe that's int more interesting if he's his own character. So going back, we pulled again, another bit of old lore, which was uh, an almost forgotten uh, module, the, the house on Griffin Hill, which was essentially Ravenloft two back in the eighties. <laughs> uh, and that. in this, yeah, that was the origin of the domain of Mordant. It was the origin oh. of, uh, the apparatus, and it was, I believe, the or the first time Aslan appeared, although hmm. he's very minor and sort of in the background. So we decided that Aslan at some point had used the apparatus to, much like Strahd did in that particular module, essentially divide himself into his good and evil halves. Except in Aslan's cases, he, he didn't really have any good in him, so he like, <laughs> divided himself into his lawful evil and lawful neutral half. And his lawful neutral half was... Uh, was Ferran Zalhonen, what, okay. what what he was before he became a lich, but who had some of the memories and did not want to become part of Aslan again. Uh, and in our campaign, again, Ferran Zalhonen could be completely different in, in everybody else's uh, campaigns, but we decided that he'd sort of appear occasionally and be a mentor. Well, not necessarily a mentor, but a mysterious figure that would sort mm -hmm. of 
uh, throw in and we could and we could slowly unveil bits of Uriah's origin that way. Uh, he very quickly became known to uh, the fans as uh, Uncle Sus because he introduced himself as Uriah's uncle. And, you know, in, a sense, he, in a sense, he is Uriah's uncle because yeah. he's kind of brothers with Aslan and Aslan is kind of Uriah's father. So technically, yeah, he's he's the uncle. Uh, once he once he got that Uncle Sus moniker, we, B Dave and I both kind of decided it's like, yeah, we should make it. He's he's completely he's in no way has nefarious. You know, he's self interested. Yeah. He's not nefarious in any way. Let let them think that he's Uncle Sus, and uh, but he's actually he he never really is working against the group or he doesn't have evil intent. Uh, and so it was it was really fun to get to be able to play essentially three characters uh, yeah. at that point. So I got to be Uriah at a PC and then two NPCs, Baron Zalhonen, the Archmage and the Lich King, Aslan Rex. And now all three of them actually are represented in the Idol Champions. It's just wild. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I absolutely loved the, the key art we that the, the Aslan was incorporated into it. Like the, the, the key arts for the game, I, I'm always enjoying, but the, the Black Dice Society ones, they have really gotten what these characters are and just have a, her, Uriah there with the, um, clutching the mace, then Aslan uh, reaching over. That's It's just, it's fantastic. Yeah, Ivy did a fantastic job. Uh, Ivy Lee, I believe, is the one mm -hmm. who did the key art uh, at Codename. And uh, lo I love that key art. It's fantastic. And of course, Aslan is, does appear in the game as well. Like there mm -hmm. are moments where Uriah, one of his special abilities essentially is that he becomes possessed by Aslan Rex, much as he did within the campaign. And uh, then I think the special effect of that is, I believe all evil champions, uh, their damage is buffed and mm. Nahara's damage, specifically Nahara's damage is buffed. So it's always good to have Nahara and Uriah together uh, in your formation. Well, actually, there's definitely something I want to touch on there. Uh, again, the, the the spoiler thing of it, though, I guess it was seen in the ad reel ahead of time. We got some skins for uh, Uriah and Nahara because they do eventually get married. Um, <laughs> I do love that the show literally started with uh, a, a wedding and ended with a wedding. It just... I love that stuff. <laughs> and they both went great. Swimmingly. They, absolutely they nothing went. wrong in any way. <laughs> magical, magical heartwarming memories. That's, you know, that's what you, that's what you go to B. Dave Walters for is the, the magical heartwarming <laughs> memories where no one is sad. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yes. Uh, so we essentially culminated with the wedding of Nahara and Uriah and, and those skins, uh, I believe they dropped this week. There is blushing yep. bride Nahara and, then they asked me, what do you want to call the, uh, Uriah's skin? And I was like, blushing broom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, come on. It's, it if, any, <laughs> if any character is going to blush, he's, it's going to be him. Uh, and of course, uh, then then it was like, okay, well, what do we do skin-wise with Aslan? And uh, it was like, well, Ferran Zalhonen, of course. So that's how he got into the game as well. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know that part. Okay. Yeah, technically, you know. I don't think Ferran ever possessed Uriah. <laughs> he was at the wedding. He was actually invited to the wedding. So it's it true. makes sense for him to be there. And I'm sure he's an archmage. He could astrally project. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, the ring bearer, uh, the familiar that accompanies uh, Uriah, is Mangata, the Moonstone Dragon, who they first met in the Feywild, which was, you know, very near and dear to uh, Uriah and Nahara, uh, was the state at the Witchlight Carnival and Mangata became a character that was recurring and most often visited Uriah uh, in his dreams and of course Mangata experiences time out of sequence so yeah there was lots of fun to be had with that. I, I've asked B Dave how he kept uh, Mangata's uh, like just straight in his head and he's like I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for Beard Quest. I know. We got to get yeah. that sequel. We got to get Beard Quest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so real real quick, uh, we're going to be doing a giveaway here in the chat in uh, a few moments. Uh, Sean is going to uh, put in there uh, a keyword for you to uh, put in. And you just put the keyword in. It will enter you for a chance to win 42 chests of your choice, excluding Bahamut chests for Isle Champions of the Forgotten Realms. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see. Oh, there there it goes right there. And what, 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 what What's the word? Type. Oh. Oh, macabre, M macabre! There we go. <laughs> oh yes, brother Uriah Macabre. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. Which they... I should mention uh, that, of course, like many people see it as a play on you know a misspelled version of macabre, which it does work on that level as well. Mm -hmm. But it's Uriah is actually named for 
uh, to Charles Dickens characters, uh, oh. Uriah Heep and Mr. Macabre. That's right. You told me that last time we talked and that blew my mind. Oh, <laughs> oh maybe. Uh -oh. What's happening? Is anything happening? Hey, oh, I see you. I'm back. Hey, how much of, how much of that did you hear? Uh, I I heard the uh the 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 characters that they stood for. Then I was saying I, I remembered you telling me that uh, last time we talked, and I I, I love that mm -hmm. homage to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, sorry, my internet, my internet it betrayed me briefly. It's okay. It, it, things happen. This is the the wonders of the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we actually have quite a few uh, uh, chat questions, so I thought uh, we we could uh, hop into there for a little bit. How's that sound? Of course, please. Let's do All it. All right. We're going to uh, start with uh, uh, Rad Ram. Uh, question, uh, does it feel more special the second time compared to Payloth uh, when it was an original character completely yours to have launch in Idol Champions? Yes, that is true. I do have two uh, characters mm -hmm. that I play in Idol Champions. Very honored by that distinction. <laughs> uh, but uh, Bayloth was not created by me. I was actually cast to play Bayloth in a video game. And uh, it was, I believe, Andrew Foley at uh, Beamdog who created him, or at least did a lot of uh, the writing uh, for his scenes. Uh, so Bayloth was a character that I played a lot, and I played him in like D&D &D Live and, and various events. But no, he was not uh, a character created from the ground up by me. So Uriah was, and so it is very special to see something that I envisioned. And, you know, it's I got to say, it's pretty cool to see your D&D &D character in in Idol Champions. It was cool when Bayloth, because mm -hmm. again, I played him in lots of D&D &D games. But again, somebody that you actually rolled up and you you decided how many torches was there, were in their backpack and uh, <laughs> it's it's very gratifying it's very gratifying i highly recommend it to everyone <laughs> closest i've got i've got a familiar in there and i'm very i'm very happy about that one <laughs> well played uh cassius 335 says question uh i don't know how black dice society is going to be replaced parentheses uh never mind topped uh but does mark have any ideas what uh he'd want to happen if in a future project to be like so say that there was something to happen with black dice society down the road like what uh what what might be going on with uriah there Hmm. Interesting. Well, again, uh, we are in heavily spoiler territory. I don't, I won't spell it all out, but yep. essentially it would be very difficult for Uriah to leave Darkon, uh, in the continuity we've established. Yeah. <laughs> however, however, uh, bringing up, uh, Mangata, the Moonstone Dragon who experiences time out of sequence oh. Mangata in the final episode mentioned it was, it was a throwaway gag by B day, to yeah. be honest, uh, as, as far as I know. Unless he, you know, maybe he, it's three-dimensional chess uh, <laughs> by, uh, or eight-dimensional chess. Yeah, uh, that's B-Dave. But uh, B-Dave had Mangata make a reference to something called Beard Quest, <laughs> and which is something they haven't experienced yet, where Uriah had a beard and there was obviously a quest involved. And uh, so because we haven't seen that yet, it's like, okay. And we also established that Uriah sort of went on adventures with Mangata in yeah. dreams. And Moonstone Dragons are like that. They can take people on trips and dreams. So, yeah, I think in order for the continuity to make sense, it would have to be during some of those dreams. So some, at some point prior to the last couple of episodes where Uriah went on some sort of dream adventure with Mangata. I think that that works and it doesn't break the continuity and you can put the toys back true, where you found true. them when that's over. And you so see, it would, th that also would allows to you that. to bring in uh, a, another new, newer Dark Lord Piddlewick. <laughs> yeah, true. Very true. Because I, I, I would uh, so need yes. that for Beard Quest. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily... I mean, it is also, given the way that things ended up, I mean, you could use... Uriah and Nahara as antagonists in a campaign. Oh, <laughs> oh, I, that's kind of cool. I like that. Because again, spoilers, please avert your eyes and ears if you, if you don't want to know. <laughs> but uh, at the end, like there was a warlock army being built in the service of uh, Darkon's new king. And, uh, you know, there was, there was all kinds of, there were shadow dragons. There were all kinds of things going on. So that might be very interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Who knows? 
and you know maybe we'll have to somewhere at some on some venue or platform have all the dark lords get together at some oh point. yeah that would that that would be a game for the ages <laughs> Uh, so this is from uh, Caleb Marin that says, question, uh, who made Uriah's shield? Uh, I have everything else and working on the holy symbol, but the shield is perplexing me. <laughs> oh, uh, the uh, the shield that I have. Yeah, the yeah. Version. That, I believe, was uh, Forged Foam made that for me. Oh. Yeah. Oh, is that one foam? Wait, it is foam. Hold on. Oh, I, I didn't will know actually, that. I, if I look at my Instagram, I'll be able to tell you exactly <laughs> the company that made it. When did I post that? When did I post that? I think it was okay. Oh god! I know I used it at Gen Con. So well, so so while you're looking that up, Lauren put a great suggestion in the chat for a name of a game that's all Dark Lords called, just called Dark Con. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> I I like that a lot. That's a that's a very good suggestion. Let's see here. Now, I wore that at Gen Con, I'm sure. I I genuinely did not know that that was made out of foam. That that is impressive looking. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and it's oh, it's it's LARP ready. It is LARPable that mm, uh, it's that LARPable. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've not heard that one before. I like that. <laughs> uh, well, well, I'll tell you while you're looking for that, uh, Kath Marin has a, a another question, which is: Does Please. Uriah still have the toe in a jar? Oh, oh, definitely. Yes. I think he, I think he carried around that around with him. We found at some point uh, it was like, is this Aslan's toe or something? And there was all the, the clone stuff. We found out, I believe it might've been in a Patreon uh, mm. video that uh, it was actually the toe of one of the other uh, Aslan clones. Oh, and was it? Yes. And he had sent them out and they were all of various classes because he wanted to get as broad a base of knowledge as possible. But yes, that was uh, that was uh, uh, that was, I think, the status of that. I think he still had that. that okay. toe. And in fact, I believe that in his possessions, in uh, like his equipment. In oh, Island is Canada, it? The toe is a certain level of uh of his possessions. I, I can't remember which one. Well, you can get a toe in game. <laughs> go, can, go open some chests. <laughs> you can get a toe in game. Okay, here we go. I finally found that post. This was... Yes, it was. Forged Foam. Awesome. Made my, who made my shield. That's very, very and cool. Do I have it here? Yes, I do. Hold on. Ooh. I even have it relatively within grasp. <laughs> I just have to move a few things that are on top of it. Here we go. Oh God, that looks so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a great job on it. Yeah, yeah. that is awesome. God, the so thank you, <laughs> thank you for for foam for this excellent LARP shield that yeah. you can hide behind as is his want. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> what. We're not going to say what it is because uh, it's, it's it will go out on a Friday. But uh, I I helped with the the brother Uriah comic uh, that's going out this Friday. Ooh, and, that's right. I I didn't yeah, see that. Yeah, and, and uh, when I sat down to write, I'm just like, well, he's got to be cowering. I mean, I can't have him doing anything else. <laughs> it's Uriah. I will on. be I will be posting that tomorrow. As a matter of fact, tomorrow yeah. morning. Be be sure to follow uh, Mark on Twitter, Mark underscore Mir. Yes, uh, and uh, or on Instagram, mr. Period Mark. Uh, yes, I do not have unified handles. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, there, I, I still want there to be a way to do that. We're just like, listen, this person's not doing jack with that. Give me the dang accounts. <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see this is gonna be uh maxi cubert that's a great name. Uh, have you tried your champion in Idle Champions? What do you think of it? I have not had the opportunity to try Uriah yet, but I look forward to someone nice at uh, Codename, uh, you know, just going on like, here's a little unlock for you. Oh, yeah, no, we can get that set up. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. We can get, we can get that worked out. Uh, let's see. Because, because uh, of course, it just dropped this week, so I yep. actually have not had the literally uh, just over twenty four hours ago. So yeah, mm -hmm. we, we there, there's still plenty of time. I uh, I have, however, watched uh, some people play with Uriah and with the full Black Dice Society yeah. because now of I was I was the last member of the Black Dice Society, and now you have uh, all six of us plus Veronica 
Yeah. Uh, so you got seven. Uh, that's what's the maximum formation size again? Oh, uh, there's uh, ten is uh, is probably the most common one. So yeah, you can get the mm-hmm. whole group in there easily. Get the whole group and then throw in. Let's see who who pairs well. Whittle would probably pair well. Oh with yeah. Society. Uh, any of the other sort of uh, Esmeralda. Yeah. Raven lofty, Raven lofty swords. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good group right there. And, and just for everyone out there that's like, that doesn't work with formations. I'm, I'm just going with what's cool, man. <laughs> yeah, just, that might. I want the aesthetic formation. <laughs> yeah, this, I, that's what I would go for too. It would, it would be just like this is really an impractical formation, and it doesn't work. The character doesn't fit in that slot. But yeah, so that's that would be my dream. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, this is uh, Rad Ram again. Uh, so wait, if, if the spontaneous discussion leading to Uriah being a clone happened before the Ferran uh, DM'd episode, does that mean Mark was actually three characters talking to himself at once? Yeah, absolutely was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100%. <laughs> and, and I think we talked about that uh, last time you were on too, because you know, that was when you were uh, DMing uh, Al Champions Presents of the... Uh, of that kind of that moment that gets joked about as a dm where it is the dm just kind of talking back and forth to themselves because there's two npcs there <laughs> sometimes oh that yeah just happens oh yeah i can quite happily do that for an hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, mark will be doing the first ever one man D D show <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, well, not the first ever. I'd have a really. Uh, I'd, I, yeah, there are some people. I've I've seen some people do. Uh, uh, I need to know what that looks like. I have to look that up after this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so I, I did want to give some some, uh, some time here at the end because you got a couple projects that you're working on uh, mm-hmm. that I, I definitely think people in the chat needs need to know about. Uh, I, first of all, I want to talk about was uh, was Gordon. You're you're in a, you're in a Batman sh- uh, f- short film. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, a Batman fan film uh, that uh, some friends of mine down in Atlanta. Uh, Prickman uh, is the writer and director, and he worked with Creative Force Films, uh, who uh, they're probably best known for. They did a Bosque fan film and a Boba Fett fan film. They did a Bosque fan film? Oh, it's called Scorekeeper. It's very good. I, I suggest oh. you just look at it. Melding of uh, of Star Wars and Predator. <laughs> it's, oh, it's I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so score, Scorekeeper is the Bosque one, and then... The second one, which I actually have a small cameo in as uh, someone on a bounty puck. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that is called Notice Integrations. And that's the the Boba Fett one. And it's it's actually, it's like, hmm, why is Darth Vader so specific about saying to Boba Fett, Notice Integrations this time? <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the job where... Oh, jeez. This where is where like, the disintegrations happen. Where he disintegrated everybody. <laughs> Uh, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, Dengar also shows up in that, oh! which, is, which is very nice. Uh, and uh, so, yes, Creative Force and Patrick, uh, uh, we shot it down in Atlanta. It's, a, as I mentioned, a Batman fan film and uh, called Gordon. So I think you you might have an idea what character it sort of focuses on. But <laughs> I was very pleased to play the Joker in oh. that one. I gotta ask, how, and, how, how did you prep for that? Like, what 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 was the what was the the thought process you went through for? Like, what's my Joker gonna be? Uh, well, I went through an intense preparation process that lasted my entire life, where I just watched, <laughs> read a lot of comics, and watched a lot of cartoons and uh, and superhero related things. Uh, it, I've always been uh, a big comic book fan, uh, and I particularly have always loved the villains and. Uh, when people ask who's your favorite voice actor, uh, I always point to the duo of Kevin Conroy oh. and Hamill from, you know, when I was a kid, Mel Blanc, of course, and yeah. whatnot, but you know, like uh, as a teen, those guys, those, yeah. and they, you know, we, it's been said many times before, but they are the real Batman and they are the real. Yeah. Joker. And of course, Kevin Conroy passed recently, uh, terrible loss. And yeah. uh, many, uh, many folks grew up with him as Batman and and with Mark Hamill as Joker. So I'd be lying if I didn't say the Mark Hamill Joker is certainly an <laughs> influence uh, on my performance, but also trying to blend, trying not to just do a carbon copy of that and yeah. blend in uh various influences uh there there have been lots of jokers uh, uh throughout uh the history i mean if you want to look at the most obviously insane joker i always point to caesar romero oh yes there is nothing yes. like a, a, a mustache painted over it's in white so in clown white which 
that that is actually disturbing. Like that's, it really is. It's just like, oh no, that that gives me a bad feeling. Uh, so. <laughs> I I actually I bought a a Caesar Romero Joker pop figure. It's him with the surfboard, mm-hmm. and it, and it wasn't just because of that. It was because they'd actually put a little mustache in white on his lip. And I went, perfect. That's the yeah. best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I think the action figure version of that too, oh, where it's really? like, it's all painted white, but you can see, no, the mustache is clearly sculpted on, on the top there. Uh, so yes, uh, I get to play the Joker in that. And that is actually dropping tomorrow. Hey! The, the internet, which you may have heard of. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's great. Uh, I've seen essentially a rough cut of it and, uh, it's very film noir shot in black and white mm. and, uh, it's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, John Williams, who was the, uh, the, the car- actor who played Gordon. We had, I had a great time working with him That's awesome. and, uh, yeah, it's, I look forward to people seeing it because where's it, uh, it going to be. Uh, that is going to be on the Creative Force uh, YouTube channel, I believe. Awesome. And and of course, if you follow my social media, I'm sure I'll be I'll be posting about it hither and yon. Well, I'm excited yeah. to see that. I can't wait to see what you. I can't, I can't wait to see uh, the 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 Mark Mir Joker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the other thing that uh, I wanted to the touch on was the the Call of Cthulhu game you're doing. I I, I love Call mm. of Cthulhu, the the TTRPG. It's one of my favorites that is out there. And you you ran one recently, and it's going up right now. Yes, yeah, we taped this a while ago. Uh, this was, again, Elder Eye Entertainment, actually. Uh, Dustin and Devin, they, oh, they got cool. in touch with me, and uh, they were working with Rural 20 and Chaosium. So uh, this Call of Cthulhu adventure, which is just sort of like a little mini campaign, uh, has been uh, premiering sh- uh, live on the Roll 20 app. Uh, two episodes are, have come out so far, so it's every Wednesday at, I want to say, I hope I get this right, 6 p.m. Pacific. You can watch it live on Roll20. And then uh, the following Sunday or Monday, so let's say Sunday, uh, go it goes up on the Chaosium, the official Chaosium YouTube channel. So currently, episode one, the VOD, the, the pre-recorded, mm-hmm. uh, is up on Chaosium's YouTube. Uh, so you can go and watch it there and, and say nice things. Uh, <laughs> please, please. Feel free to leave likes and and uh, nice comments. Uh, I was very I was very happy with the way it turned out. Uh, we've got an amazing group of investigators: uh, Sage Ryan, who of course is in Black Dice Society as well. Uh, we have Carlos Luna. Uh, he was fantastic uh, and actually stepped in at last minute, which was much oh, wow. appreciated. Uh, we got Seer Sword. Uh, she is amazing. She is amazing. <laughs> and uh, we also have. The writer and director of that of that Batman fan film that I just <laughs> talked about, and in fact, when we were doing this Call of Cthulhu uh, recording, that's when Patrick talked to me uh, about like, eh, you know, the, he, I'd seen the script before and I'd said, oh, I love this script. Yeah. So we actually seriously started talking about like, we should uh, make a Batman fan film, huh? Uh, and <laughs> so that all came together. So I got I got two projects with Mr. Patrick Logan. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> that are, that are dropping right now. Uh, once again, uh, Bookshops of Arkham is the title of the Call of Cthulhu adventure. It's actually co-written by my wife, Belinda Cornish. Oh! And, yes, and our friend Darren Ormandy. And uh, they wrote an amazing, very in-depth campaign that I I hope that I've managed to do justice to. Uh, <laughs> it's great. They, they write amazing Call of Cthulhu stuff. I've got to be an NPC in uh, several of their adventures. And... Uh, this was the first time I, I was the keeper, like the, the actual keeper for one of their adventures. And it was great. We had, as I said, amazing investigators, uh, great production. Uh, and the set and the, the outfits are just incredible looking. <laughs> mm-hmm. And a uh, fantastic job by uh, our editing team of, I believe, three different editors who who made it uh, look so great. Oh, wow. in the end. And uh, including Carlos, actually, he did. He did a fantastic job. So, uh, yes, go check that out on. Rule 20 live on Wednesdays on their Twitch. And then uh, the following week, it's a uh, weekend. It's up on Chaosium's YouTube channel. Heck yeah. Go definitely go check, uh, check that out. Uh, I I'm, I'm literally going to be watching it after out of the skull. <laughs> <laughs> the bookshops of Arkham. Once again, that's the bookshops of Arkham. And there, you know, Arkham, there's a Batman connection there too. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all coming together. <laughs> 
Uh, well, Mark, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about Uriah and all this fun stuff. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, yeah. It literally anytime. <laughs> uh, if people wanted to find you and what you do on the interwebs, where could they do so? Well, you can find me on Twitter as Mark underscore Mir. I'm on Instagram as MR period Mark Mir. That's Mr. Mark Mir. Uh, of course, you can see me, uh, as mentioned, on Chaosium's YouTube channel and Roll20 Twitch with Bookshops of Arkham. And uh, you can watch me in Gordon, uh, the Batman fan film Gordon by Creative Force Films as The Joker. Yeah. Uh, and that will be dropping tomorrow. And, you know, I'll always be doing stuff here and there. <laughs> and and of course i i would be i would be a fool if i did not mention that i am available on cameo for all your mass effect catchphrase related needs do it do it um yeah and of course you can unlock uh brother Uriah right now in idol champions uh and uh finish out the uh the, the black dice society uh formation mm -hmm. um i actually just realized i somehow got to interview all of you on idol insights i hosted for uh for uh, todd when uh, he was out and dj was on so i actually got to do all these interviews <laughs> i have my own collection <laughs> so you do trevor so yes. you do uh but yeah that is gonna do it for this week's episode mark again thank you so much for joining us uh that's gonna do it for this week's episode of island sight so until next week take care of yourself